My name is Pune Seberi. I'm a physician in occupational and environmental medicine. And I was asked to discuss the association between conflict and climate and the public health consequences. And um, I don't have any PowerPoints and I'm reading from my notes because I have a lot of information for you and I want to make sure that I cover them all. So violence can be divided into three categories, self-inflicted, interpersonal, and intergroup. Intergroup is also what we refer to as collective violence. It turns out that climate change increases the chances of all forms of violence. But for the purposes of our talk today, I'm going to focus on the concept of collective violence only. I'll discuss how human-induced global climate change is a catalyst for all these forms of violence, including war, armed conflict, state-sponsored violence such as genocide or torture, and organized violent crimes such as gang warfare. The fundamental reason that climate change leads to conflict is that it causes environmental scarcity. Environmental scarcity, what is it? It is tied to three factors. It is tied to diminishing natural resources like forests and drinking water, fresh water, diminishing human security such as ethnic clashes, and diminished societal stability such as urban unrest. With environmental scarcity, every right that is stated in the Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is threatened. Examples of these rights are adequate standards of living for well-being, for food, and as a public health professional, it is important to stress how collective violence causes injury, illness, disability, and death. Furthermore, when, um, when health supporting infrastructure of societies break down, vulnerable populations suffer the most. Therefore, climate change is a cause of collective violence and therefore a societal and public health threat. Okay? Now let's go into a little bit more details about that. Beginning in the 1950s, an age began that we call the Anthropocene Age, the Age of Anthropocene. This period is not just in the name, it's actually clearly marked in the geological changes that we see in the layers of Earth. The proliferation of chemical pollutants and rising greenhouse gases have changed the planet, have altered the planet since the 1950s, and these changes are studied in relation to incidents of violence around the globe. This is actually a very hot area of research. So let us take each climate event and look at its relation with violence and conflict. So from the 1950s um, to 2004, in the tropics, during the El Nino years, the probability of new civil conflict went up by three to six percent each time there was an El Nino. And therefore, since that time, El Ninos have influenced the development of civil conflict by a total of 21 percent. One out of five. <laughs> Next example, drought. That's a well-known um, example of extreme weather event that um, is rising with severity and frequency as the earth temperatures rise. In Somalia, from 1997 to 2009, the droughts that led to the instability in the prices of livestock and crop failure was a fundamental contributor to the internal conflict and famine that followed and lasted for decades in that country. In many other parts of the world that receive an average amount of rainfall, every time there's a decrease in rainfall or excessive rainfall, we also call it excessive precipitation, there is a rise in violence in the following year. Globally, between 1960 and 2007, there were 121 just water-related conflicts, with the annual frequency rising in the later years. It may seem as if it's not, it's not easy to link climate change to what is generally seen as a politically induced event. But there have been many, many studies. To, in summary, there have been 60 longitudinal studies and at least 50 quantitative studies with meta-analyses of all of them. And they all show that deviation from normal weather patterns lead to increases in intergroup conflict. 
This correlation between extreme weather and violence is 14 to 50 percent stronger in poorer populations. In 2009, United Nations Refugee Agency estimated that 20 million people have been forced to move by factors related to climate change, mainly due to storms and floods. They estimated that by 2050, there may be between 50 to 250 million climate refugees. And remember from the graph during the uh, noontime, 2050 is before we even get to that you know, um, uh, two degree uh, rise in temperature. Of the four causes of forced migration, forced migration is what we were just talking about. They include political instability, economic tensions, ethnic conflict, and environmental degradation. Three of them are directly or indirectly brought about by climate change. In other words, climate change drives forced migration, not only due to collective conflict, but because of environmental changes, such as sea level rise, flooding, and other extreme weather events. And it does that because it destroys housing, jobs, and security. Forced migrants are less likely to have access to safe food, water, sanitation, medical care, and public health services. Rising sea levels also impact one-fifth of the world population that live in coastal areas, such as low-lying island nations, like the Marshall Islands, or densely populated coastal regions like Bangladesh. As the sea levels rise, saltwater incursion into bodies of fresh water damages crops and renders drinking water unsafe. That is what's happening in the bayou regions of states such as Louisiana. In total, around the globe, 162 million people are at risk of forced migration due to sea level rise. In summary, Collective violence due to climate change poses multiple serious threats to health and human rights. While as a developed nation, the United States produces the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions, it is the rest of the world that feels the impact. In fact, the burden of this impact falls on non-combatant civilians, vulnerable populations, and poorer people. This is the highest form of climate injustice. Here in Philadelphia, we live in the temperate part of the United States and the impacts of climate change are perhaps not seen as severely as the rest of the world. But according to reports by Philadelphia Mayor's Office, this city is destined to become much hotter and much wetter in the future. These are the very events that lead to increased violence and forced migration in other parts of the world and the country. To prevent collective violence and its adverse health effects and protect human rights, we must, as a global nation, that drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, transition to clean renewable sources of energy, and raise public awareness about the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much.